Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, we've definitely had a very interesting second day of this micro-credential forum. And I'm very happy to welcome you to this se session, Making Sense of Micro-Credential. I'm very happy to introduce Jackie Pichard. She is the Director of Research Policy and Partnerships at the Higher Education Quality Council of Ontario. Uh, she guides research projects and works with external partners to explore innovations and improvements in higher education. Prior to joining HECO, Jackie worked as a consultant at an Indigenous advisory services firm, as a community organizer at Simon Fraser University, and as a government policy analyst. She has a Master's of Public Policy from Simon Fraser University and a Bachelor of Bachelor of Arts with Honors in Political Studies from Queen's Universities. And she's gonna be sharing today the insights of a very interesting research project that they did. We were chatting a little bit about it before the session. So without further ado, Jackie, the virtual floor or screen, I guess is yours. Thank you so much, Rocio. I'm just gonna try and share my screen here. Is, is that working? Looks good. Yes. Yeah, so you can see the presentation making sense of micro credentials over there. Yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much, Rocio, for the introduction and to eCampus for the invitation to be here today. Um, without further ado, we'll get right into it. I'll share some of HECO's research about micro credentials. So I'll start by quickly introducing my organization, HECO, the Higher Education Quality Council of Ontario. We're a provincially funded government agency. We conduct research and offer recommendations to improve the quality of higher education in Ontario. Our research is public and it's all available on our website, uh, heco.ca. Here is an outline of what's to come um, this morning. I'll start by walking you through HECO's uh, micro-credentials research, which was published in May of 2021. Then I'll talk about two more recent initiatives that I've been involved with, which I think complement our research pretty nicely. Uh, first, the UNESCO consensus building process that Mark Brown actually mentioned this morning in his keynote. Um, and then I'll talk about the Credential As You Go initiative out of the United States. Uh, so by way of background, HECO's interest in micro-credentials really grew out of our lifelong learning research. In 2019, we published a paper on lifelong learning that made the case that the economy is changing quickly and in unpredictable ways. And that as time goes on, more and more Canadians are becoming vulnerable to those economic changes. The pandemic has of course exacerbated economic vulnerabilities since the time of writing that paper. Um, and while we can't predict the specific changes coming down the pike as a result of this pandemic or otherwise, we can anticipate and prepare for change in general. And one way to do that is by building an agile system of lifelong learning. Um, so we wanna prepare students to adapt and thrive in these unpredictable times. Um, an effective lifelong learning model should start by laying a foundation of transferable skills and of knowledge, um, but it should also offer opportunities for students to return to school throughout their working lives via short, affordable, and flexible programs. Aligned with this thinking, in 2020, UNESCO called for the transformation of schools and universities into lifelong learning institutions, placing vulnerable groups at the core of lifelong learning policy agendas and establishing lifelong learning as a common good. Micro-credentials could bring this vision for an effective lifelong learning model to life, particularly on the upskilling side of things. So with that context from our previous research in mind, we had two overarching aims with our micro-credentials research. The first was to help establish some common understanding. We engaged experts and consulted literature from around the world to help us answer questions like, what constitutes a micro-credential? And how is a micro-credential different from say, a digital badge or a certificate? Um, we also conducted a literature review looking at definitions being used globally. Our second goal was to gather strategic insights from key stakeholders. We wanted to know how working age Canadians feel about upskilling opportunities like micro-credentials. What about these opportunities might interest them? Where do they see value? Um, and we wanted to know how employers feel about these opportunities from both a hiring perspective and from the perspective of um, internal employee development. 
how would employees react? How would employers, sorry, react to seeing a micro credential on a job application? What would make them think positively about that credential? And last but not least, we wanted to understand how employer and prospective student views line up with post secondary institutional offerings. So to achieve our goals, in addition to conducting a thorough literature review, we interviewed stakeholders. We ran a survey of prospective students, that is Canadians between the ages of 18 and 64, who are not currently enrolled in a post-secondary program. And that survey was administered by Abacus Data. Uh, we also ran a survey of Canadian employers, which we administered in partnership with the Business Higher Education Roundtable. And we ran a survey of post-secondary institutions, which we administered in partnership with Colleges and Institutes Canada. So what did we find? One of our most obvious and significant findings was an awareness gap. By and large, the employers we surveyed were not familiar with the term micro-credential. 60% were not familiar at all with the term, and only 10% indicated they had a good understanding. Respondents uh, were even less familiar with synonymous terms like micro-certification, nano-degree, or nexus degree. For the students we surveyed, while 25% had heard the term, only 8% said they knew it well, Awareness of the term was higher among younger working age Canadians, those with greater, high, with greater household incomes, and those with a university education. So motivated by this awareness gap um, and confusion over what micro-credential the term really means, uh, we sought to provide some clarity. So we drew from international definitions and the advice of the experts we interviewed and developed the definition on the screen. Our definition centers on micro-credentials being shorter than traditional credentials like a degree or a diploma, and they are shorter by virtue of being more narrowly focused on one or a few competencies. So our definition is intentionally descriptive rather than prescriptive. Uh, we wanted to offer a definition that describes the full range of programs currently available while leaving a lot of room for organizations to advance their own prescriptive aims. For example, a college might say that in addition to being short and focused, their micro credentials will also be industry aligned and flexible. Um, by using the word program, our definition also implies an intentional learning experience or pedagogy, differentiating micro credentials from, say, a digital badge. Um, and we consider this to very much be an umbrella definition, which will encompass a lot more prescriptive um, definitions within it. So our definition leaves a lot of room for variation as displayed in this graphic. Our goal with this graphic, what we're calling typology, is to help address some conflation of terms and misguided assumptions about micro-credentials. For example, that they're all offered online. Um, so micro-credentials can vary in terms of the purpose they serve for the learner or in the way the credential is stored and shared. In some cases, micro-credential earners receive a digital badge embedded with metadata about the issuing institution, uh, while others obtain a traditional paper credential. Micro-credentials may recognize a student's participation in a program or their demonstrated competence on assignments or exams. Uh, in some cases, they may even be awarded only when a really high benchmark, benchmark for mastery is met. Um, so, for example, they have to retake assignments until they get 90% on them. Um, to some extent, this same graphic could be applied to most other credentials uh, offered in post-secondary institutions, uh, but we feel it's particularly uh, topical in this um, context of micro-credentials. Okay, so now I'll get into our stakeholder surveys. And I'll start with employers. Once provided with a definition, we asked employers how they would react to seeing a micro-credential on the application of a job candidate. About 60% of respondents indicated micro-credentials would increase their confidence in a prospective employee's skills. About two-thirds said they would see a micro-credential as highly favorable if it were directly related to the job at hand, if it were competency-based, and or if it were accredited. Survey respondents were less interested in the short aspect of micro-credentials, but bear in mind we asked these respondents to take a hiring perspective. We also asked employers to think about micro-credentials for the purposes of internal staff training and development. In this context, nearly 70% said they would have a highly favorable view of micro-credentials that were competency-based. 
alignment with industry and flexibility were the next most favorable features. And in this case, respondents had a relatively positive view of the shorter length of a micro credential. Now let's take a look at some perspective student perspectives. Um, so as a reminder, we surveyed over 2000 Canadian residents aged 18 to 64 who were not enrolled in a post secondary program at the time of the survey. Once provided with a definition, interest in micro credentials was high. 74% of working age Canadians demonstrated interest in micro credentials for either professional development, personal development, or both. Survey respondents recognized the value of short focused programs today and in the future with 78% saying they could see these being important for future proofing their careers. Um, interest in career change may also be driving part of the appeal. 42% of employed respondents expressed interest in either changing employers or their careers. Um, and the pand pandemic is also having an effect. 68% of respondents experienced some kind of disruption to their work as a result of COVID-19, including for 32% of employed respondents having to learn new skills on the job. Of unemployed respondents, 57% were interested in returning to the workforce in an entirely new field. And among employed respondents, increased earnings and interest in learning something new or acquiring new skills are other key drivers of interest in micro-credentials. The working age Canadians we surveyed were given a list of potential micro-credential features like the ones presented to employers. After affordable and employer recognized, respondents indicated that whether a micro-credential is flexible is most important. Interestingly, being local and stackable ranked less highly than my colleagues and I had anticipated. So last but not least, we surveyed 161 publicly assisted colleges and universities across Canada. Most respondents were in leadership roles at their institution. Uh, and we heard from them that most institutions were either already offering micro-credentials or planning to do so in the future. Most, about 90%, said their programs are targeting working adults who are looking to change their occupation and or employees of industry partners. We posed the same question about features to this group. Respondents rated relevance and industry alignment as the most favorable. Being short and bearing a common definition or understanding were ranked second and third. And notably here, 36% of respondents were indifferent about whether a micro-credential should be online. So based on the evidence we gathered, HECO identified six quality markers, relevance, accreditation, standardization, assessment, flexibility, and stackability. So we suggested that institutions developing micro-credentials should strive to incorporate these where it makes sense, but in all cases, they should be transparent about these markers. Um, so I'll share a bit of the rationale underlying these. To start with, our survey, resulted, our survey results suggested that above all else, working age Canadians care that micro-credentials are affordable and that employers see value in them. For employers to see value, micro-credentials should feature assessment of competencies, and they should be relevant or industry aligned. Employers also cared about accreditation and standardization, and flexibility when thinking about micro-credentials for internal staff development. Flexibility was really important to prospective students, too. Stackability needs a bit of unpacking. This is something Canadian colleges and universities care a lot about. Employers and Canadians showed less interest. Um, and after our interviews at HECO, we have mixed views about it. Uh, we think it's important that institutions are transparent about how micro-credentials relate to other credentials, but we also think it's essential that micro-credential programs are valuable in and of themselves. So we caution institutions against modularizing traditional programs, unless that modularization, that breaking down and, and repackaging is expected to serve specific learners' needs. I had a fascinating conversation about the strengths and weaknesses about stackability with the folks at the non-degree credentials network in the States, which I'll, I'll talk more about in a few minutes. Um, and we published the transcript from that conversation in the evolution. So if this is something stackability that you're thinking about, I encourage you to check out uh, that two-part series in the evolution. 
Okay, so now I'm going to shift gears a bit and share two more recent research initiatives that might be of interest, starting with the UNESCO consensus building work. Uh, and Mark Brown mentioned this this morning. So over the summer of 2021, UNESCO commissioned a study led by Dr. Beverly Oliver uh, with a global panel of experts in credentialing, qualifications, and micro-credentials. The panel, which I was a part of, received three iterations of a definition and had an opportunity to provide feedback on all three iterations. I'm going to share the fourth version of the definition and its explanatory text on the next slide. This was the version that all members of the panel agreed we could live with. Um, so you'll see overlap with HECO's definition and the addition of some prescriptiveness, which I think is really exciting and positive. Um, I should highlight that the proposed definition is not officially endorsed by UNESCO, but it will likely inform their position in time. So this is the text meant to put the definition in context. Um, it highlights some of the similarities and differences between macro credentials and micro credentials. It starts with a definition of the broadest category credentials, uh, which both macro and micro credentials fall within. So credentials verify, validate, confirm, or corroborate a person's learning achievements, knowledge, and preparedness for performing tasks. And it defines my macro credentials as generally including degrees, diplomas, certificates, and licenses often awarded by accredited, recognized, or regulated educational or and other institutions. They indicate learning achievement of a broad body of knowledge, transferable skills, or technical profici proficiency, and may take a number of years to complete. Um, so you'll see these uh, underlined terms contrasting with the micro-credential definition on the next screen. Um, so here is the micro-credential definition that the UNESCO panel, again, could live with. Um, so I'll reiterate that this definition is not intended to replace national or regional definitions. It is an attempt to distill what experts around the world agree they could agree on um, so far about micro-credentials. And that is that micro-credentials are focused on a specific set of learning outcomes in a narrow field of learning and achieved over a shorter period of time than macro credentials. They are offered by commercial entities, private providers and professional bodies, traditional education and training providers, community organizations, and other types of organizations. So a micro credential is a record of focused learning achievement, verifying what the learner knows, understands, or can do. It includes assessment based on clearly defined standards and is awarded by a trusted provider. It has standalone value and may also contribute to or complement other micro-credentials or macro-credentials, uh, and it meets standards required by relevant quality assurance. Um, so I'll highlight just quickly a few areas where there was less consensus. Uh, so the panel was divided on whether recognition of prior learning should be included. We were also conflicted about the most appropriate terminology to describe a trusted provider. So uh, competent organization and recognized body were what we went with in the end, but does that really add clarity? We weren't sure. Um, lastly, there were some disagreements about whether quality assurance needed to be explicitly called out in the definition. Um, so again, still not full consensus, I think, around, around all of these things, but I think it's a great progressive way of defining and thinking about micro-credentials. And lastly, I want to talk about the Credential As You Go initiative. Um, so this work is funded by the Lumina Foundation and led by folks at SUNY and George Washington University, uh, as well as a huge advisory committee of educational researchers and practitioners. It started in response to the large number of Americans who have some post-secondary education, but no credential to show for it. Um, so this phenomenon has been contributing to disparities in employment outcomes, debt levels, and a myriad of related social and economic uh, factors. So the initiative recognizes a need to adapt with the times, calling existing degree structures inflexible and out of sync with the needs of 21st century learners. The Credential As You Go initiative seeks to develop a nationally recognized incremental credentialing system in the states. They want to build a system that embraces traditional degree structures, complementing those structures with credentials, including but not limited to micro credentials, um, that serve a broader group of Americans with accessible post secondary education throughout their lives. Um, so 
Tied to that, the initiative seeks to increase American awareness of and value for incremental credentials, ensure equity, quality, and integrity of incremental credentials, develop purposeful policy and practice uh, reforms to support incremental credentialing, and align this work with other efforts in the learn and work ecosystem. So this is the framework that they've developed through the first phase of the initiative. It outlines the different ways in which uh, incremental or shorter connected credentials might appeal to learners. You can see that they are narrowly defining micro-credentials as something that could stack towards degrees. In Ontario and most other parts of the world involved in the UNESCO initiative I just mentioned, I think micro-credentials are being thought of as a broader category uh, with the potential to serve several of these purposes like professional development um, that is not part of a degree pathway. Um, but I share this with you because I think it's helpful inspiration for bringing the lifelong learning model that I shared uh, at the beginning of this presentation to life. Um, and to illustrate that we still have a long way to go with getting consensus around what the term micro-credential actually applies to internationally. Um, so both the credential as you go framework and the UNESCO definition align quite nicely with this graphic that HECO shared in our micro-credentials report. We argued that micro-credentials hold most value for adult learners as a top-up or complement to traditional education, not a replacement. That said, they can also serve other learners. For example, recent high school graduates, uh, micro-credentials could serve as an introduction to an area of study or employment before committing. Uh, they can top up traditional post-secondary and help learners adapt to an ever-changing economy and world. Essentially, there is a lot of potential for micro-credentials to meet the needs of 21st century learners if we can all get on the same page about what they are and what they could be. Um, I'm hoping all of the projects I've just described and the work that eCampus is leading will help get us there. And with that, I will wrap up and turn things back to Rocio for questions. Thank you, Jackie. It's definitely very interesting to see what different stakeholders in the system are uh, understanding about the terms and the potential and especially the, the quality elements of what makes micro-credentials valuable and the gaps that we have in there. So I want to open the, uh, the room for our audience to ask some questions if they have any for Jackie. I see a couple of questions here. The first one is about the UNESCO, not official definition, but the one that we can live with for now. Uh, it says, there seems to be a lack of external relevance in this definition. Quality is important, but what about employer receptivity? Do you know how employers were considered or if they were considered in, in this alignment of the UNESCO definition? That's a really interesting point. I'm not sure if any of the experts um, on the panel were employers. That doesn't mean they weren't. It means I'm not aware of them. Um, uh, but I know that this panel was actually, I think, pretty broad in terms of their thinking about who could offer a micro-credential. So employers were certainly considered in that group, um, as were nonprofit organizations and, and other bodies. That It was definitely thinking about uh, things a bit more broadly than than we were in our research, which was um, definitely focused in the higher education space. Um, but it, it's a good question. I'm not sure if employers were were part of that group um, thinking about the uh, the criteria and what we could live with. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, that that leaves a good segue into the next next question, which is. In your research, uh, how many of the employers that you surveyed were small and medium enterprises? As we heard from this morning's uh, keynote presentation, that's probably where the most benefit for micro-credentials is, or large companies might have their own in-house professional development uh, initiatives. Um, so just curious to know how many, if you know, were like small and medium enterprises and if there's any difference between how they perceive micro-credentials versus large corporations or employers? This is a good question. And I'm gonna to admit to something that Rosio and I were talking about just before this presentation. In my mind, this work feels 
um, like quite a while ago. So I'm going to forgive me that I will forget some of the specifics, but we did ask uh, all of the employers to um, note the size of their business when they were responding. And we had a range of, I think we had at least a, a handful from each of the groups that uh, each of the sizes um, that we had given as options, but I'm not going to, I don't remember specifically how many were in each bucket. Um, that should be outlined in our report and I can go back, uh, if I can get the name of the person asking, I can get back in touch with them. Um, but yeah, we, we did have a range of sizes from across Canada uh, responding to that survey. Excellent. Uh, well, we'll follow up on, on that one. Would be interesting to know. We have another good question in the chat. It says, speaking about prior learning recognition, is there some research or reflection on admission criteria to register to micro-credentials? Yeah, that's a great question and something I think a lot about. Um, and what is the role for micro-credentials in prior learning? I will say that that was a specific area of debate um, in that uh, UNESCO panel. Should micro-credentials be awarded exclusively on the basis of prior learning, or do you need to participate? I think the view that, that HECO has at this time, although I'll, I'll note that it's evolving constantly, is that micro-credentials are associated with a, a program, a learning program. So it, it's not um, simply for... Uh, recognition of prior learning, we would see that more as a digital badge or something like that. Um, there is a, uh, our understanding is that there is kind of a pedagogy associated with a micro-credential. Um, but other parts of the world are, are not necessarily thinking about micro-credentials in that way. And I had a conversation with Beverly Oliver about this, where she said, nope, in Australia, we're off and running uh, with micro-credentials that are that are solely focused on prior learning. So again, I wouldn't be surprised if our thinking evolves on that. Um, I do think there are lots of micro-credentials that um, will award, you know, uh, will involve both um, pedagogy and um, that recognition of prior learning, much like our traditional credentials do. Um, so I think, yes, there is a, a space for prior learning assessment in micro-credentials. The question for me is whether uh, we can think about micro-credentials as exclusively being uh, assessment of prior learning. Um, and again, this space is, is changing very quickly and evolving very quickly. So uh, maybe, maybe soon, yeah. Maybe soon. We have another question that says, a lot of micro-credentials is focused on skills and competencies relevant for the workplace. Um, we have a question about, uh, is there space in this definitions for learning topics of personal interest? Oh, I think so, absolutely. I think when, when I think about micro-credentials, and again, we started our research um, with the frame of our lifelong learning research. So we were very motivated by workplace training, um, recognizing that these hold a lot, of, a lot of value for people who might have to advance or pivot. Uh, or want to advance or pivot in the workplace. Um, we think about micro-credentials uh, more for upskilling than reskilling. Someone who needs to whole, learn a whole new skill set is probably not going to be served by something so short and focused. Um, so that's that's the, the niche that we saw micro-credentials filling. But as you saw from the survey results, when we spoke to Canadians, um, a, many of them re responded to say that, no, I'd be interested in this for my own personal development. Um, so I think there is opportunity. It's not, I think, the, the main driver or impetus uh, for these from a, a government perspective. Um, but from an institutional perspective, yeah, there's, there's interest, there's appetite among Canadians uh, to enroll in these programs. And if the pandemic um, work from home uh, situation continues, I think there's, there's probably time for people to enroll in these kinds of programs uh, if they're available. Excellent. Um, and just for last minutes, I would love to ask another question. You've been involved in this very difficult task of making sense of how different stakeholders are understanding micro-credentials and therefore applying that understanding in the way they design them. So it's interesting to see how HECO used this evidence-informed approach of Let's understand first what is valuable for employers, what's valuable for Canadians, and what's valuable for post-secondary institutions, and then use that to build um, 
some quality standards of what is most relevant ab about them and, and try to steer the design through that. So mm -hmm. as they keep evolving, as we keep understanding this very diverse landscape of micro-credentials, what do you think are the most important questions to keep asking to reach that alignment and understand that that could help expand the impact of micro-credentials? Yeah, really good question. I think for me, it would be coming back to their impact. So if, again, if we see micro-credentials as helping to primarily uh, support people to adapt and thrive in these uncertain economic times, the question for me would be, are they doing that? So are we, see, uh, are we seeing people enroll in micro-credentials and then um, have access to new or uh, different employment opportunities? Is it even, uh, there, there, there's lots of measures. Is it, is it increasing employment satisfaction? Um, are employers able to access uh, the talent that they need as a result of these micro-credentials, um, even for their own internal staff uh, development, are they serving that purpose? So um, while I just said, you know, I think, sure, there's a market for micro-credentials in the, the personal interest category, and that's great. Um, I think for me, the, the main point of interest is, are they actually advancing our goals around lifelong learning, employability, um, and, and serving um, those needs, maybe as well responding to um, social and economic um, issues as they emerge. Uh, like the pandemic, we saw a, micro, a lot of micro-credentials that were designed to help um, support the pandemic response, um, which is really exciting and interesting too. So maybe those two drivers of supporting um, employment and then um, social and economic responses um, would be my, my ultimate measures understanding the impact. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Well, we are at time. So thank you so much, Jackie, for sharing all of this important insights with us. And thank you to everyone joining. I think I hope you can keep enjoying the next couple of uh, conversations that we have for this micro credential forum. Thank you, everyone for joining us.